So 66% of young adults who attend church in high school reportedly stopped attending church regularly, which is at least twice a month or more, for at least a year between the ages of 18 and 22. Literally over half of the students that we graduate, that the church graduates on, reports to not attend church for at least a year. Could have been a span longer. They could have never gone back to church. But at least for a year, 66% of the students that we graduate will never attend church. According to a Barna study, further in that study, one third of Gen Z, 37% to be exact, believes it's not possible to know God if God is for sure real. That's compared to 32% of adults. On the other side of that coin, the teens who do believe that there is a God, they know that he exists, they're actually less likely than adults to say that they are very convinced that it is true. Only 50% of those teens that actually reported to believe that there is a God would say, ah, I'm pretty sure, but I'm not positive. Today you can see I'm our student pastor and we're getting ready for a week at camp. We've got bags packed. There's a trailer outside that's already hooked up to a van full of gear that we're gonna drive down after this. We've got 200 folks coming with us to Falls Creek this year. Yeah, that's awesome, yeah. We got 200 folks coming with us to Falls Creek and I get the opportunity to preach to us today and I want you to open up God's word to the book of Judges because these facts should be startling. Now if you hear these truths, right? If you hear that 60% or 66% of these students that we graduate are never gonna go back to church, if you hear that and you take some pride in your generation, right? And I had a reality check. We were watching softball and Eden and I, you know, I've been reminding Eden, she's in her 30s, and I'm still enjoying my 20s. Eden uh, last week turned 31, so she's getting, you know, quite a bit older than I am, and uh, I still have a little bit of time left in my 20s, but we were talking about the generation that we are in. She wasn't in the last service. I'm a little scared this service. Uh, we were talking about the generation that we were in, and I was, I was talking to her about running the bases, and I felt real confident in my ability to run the bases. Um, and so she's at, since then made me start running, and uh, it's been less than enjoyable. But here's the reality. I was looking at that, and I remember talking about running the bases, and I had an age check. I recognized that I was substantially older than most of the college athletes that I enjoy watching on TV. And so I recognize that I'm no longer in what most of us would consider the next generation. And so I'm with the older ones of us in this room, right? Not the students, but I'm with the older ones of us in this room who reads these statistics. And here's the reality. If we read these statistics and we kind of have pride that we're on the other side of, of adolescence, we, if, if you have pride, yeah, I survived that and I believe God's word to be true. Or if you get a little bit angry or snarky whenever you look next to you and there's a youth on their Bible app instead of, you know, the King's James Version, King James Version which is the real version, right? You know, they don't even read the Bible anymore, right? You know what I mean? If you feel that or you invest pride in your age and that you've made it, basically if you feel anything less than what I'm choosing to call holy guilt, then you're missing what God has called you to do for the next generation. Today in Judges 2, we're gonna be looking at um, kind of an overview of the story of Judges, but specifically landing on the second chapter and a little bit of history on this, and, and spoiler alert, Judges 2 is about an entire generation that did not know the Lord. You know, and a lot of times I get to be in our youth ministry and I get to have Bible clubs and, and basketball days and I get to see these students worship Christ. I get to see them inv invest in, and invite their friends to church. And so for me, I get to see a side of the next generation that maybe not all of you get to. And the reality is we have some real Christian leaders in this up and coming generation and they're on fire for the gospel. 
And so for us, if you think Judges 2 is a picture of what is coming up, you're sadly mistaken because we do not have a lost generation, but we do have a generation that needs our help to grow them up, guide them, disciple them, and send them out into the world. Where we find ourselves in, in Judges today, so Joshua was the leader. Now, if you remember who Joshua was, throughout the Old Testament, there was this real heavy hitter. His name was Moses, right? If we were gonna make a movie today and we were gonna choose any Bible story that I thought would make me rich and I was gonna produce this movie, we would probably choose Moses, and we would call it the Exodus story, and I would make millions because Moses got to do all the cool stuff. We got pyrotechnics with the bush that wasn't consumed, right? We got a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Uh, fire. I'm gonna throw some confetti in there, and Moses is the hero, and it's the best story in the world. And then who's Joshua? First chapter of Joshua tells us he was Moses' aide, the assistant, the coffee guy, the dude with the thing that goes, in scene, right? He was the helper. But what did he get to do? You look at Joshua, uh, the Lord comes up to Joshua in Joshua chapter one, and, and it's pretty funny. He says, hey, Moses is dead, it's your turn. Joshua, I just picture him, you know, because I'm in the spirit of softball still, I just picture him eating sunflower seeds in the bullpen, like who? Oh, he's talking to me. And so Joshua gets called in, and what does God say? He says, I'm gonna deliver all this to you. You just have to stay rooted in my word, be strong and courageous, and go get what I'm giving you. So Joshua leads, and then we find ourselves now in Judges, chapter two, verse eight, and Joshua, the son of Nun, servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So we got Moses' aid. He grew up learning how to lead, watching Moses, one of the big heavy hitters, do it. And then Joshua dies, and now we have this entire uh, generation that saw all of, the, all of the goodness, all of the blessings of what God had done, and those firsthand generation died off, and now we're left with Genesis 2, which is the generation that was following the folks that saw it all firsthand, and what happened? Not a single one of them knew the Lord. Not a single one of them was told about the blessings of the generation that they're following, of the miracles of what God had done. So this week, as we get ready for Falls Creek, I've got three prayers that I want you to join with me. And I don't even think they're in your notes. So you're gonna have to do a little note taking. So grab a pen, let's go. Prayer number one is this. I want you to join with me in this all week. The first prayer is that we need to be reminded, Lord, remind me that the next generation is not a problem to navigate, but a mission field that we are commanded by God to engage and reach. The next generation is not a problem, it's our mission. As Great Commission Baptists, we should recognize what? That the Great Commission does not call us to reach our peers. The Great Commission calls us to reach all, teach them what God has taught us, and then baptize them, raise them up, send them out to do it again, right? It's not limited to a generation. It's not limited to a denomination. The Great Commission calls us to invest and invite and show people about Jesus. Number one in your notes, invest in the future. And this isn't like some cool, like cute thing that I came up with for your notes so you had something to follow along with me. God really calls us to invest in the future. What happens if we don't? In your Bible, Star Judges 2.10, that whole generation had gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You see, the burden of discipleship falls on us. Or maybe next to Judges 2.10, if the Lord's convicting you, you could write, the burden of discipleship falls on me. So what's the good news? Well, the good news is God doesn't just leave us out there wondering. He actually shows us. So you don't have to turn there. It's gonna be on the screen. But next to Judges 2.10, would you just write Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9? And I'll read it to you. Here's what God says. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now you may wanna underline that whenever you get there later because Jesus seemed to think that that one was pretty important. Love the Lord with God with all you got. You see, these commandments that I give you today should be on your heart. And then he says, not only should they be on your heart, but they should actually be part of your actions. See, a head knowledge of God is not actually a relationship with God until what Paul tells us happens in Romans 
uh, 10, 9, and 10, right? We are actually transformed because we actually believe and confess. We act it out. So what he's saying here is that you should also take what's in your heart and impress it upon your children. Well, I don't want to force my kids into a faith that's not their own. What? (laughs) Hold on. Let me help us here. You're not going to impress a faith upon your kids that they do not watch or that they do not want whenever they've spent their entire life watching you take part in the uh, the blessings of what God has done in your life. I'm not asking you to hit them over the head with the Bible. I'm asking you to live out what you say you believe here and then bring your kids along on the journey. And don't get mad at me. I'm not even really asking you. It's God. He says, impress it upon your children. Well, how? I don't know. It's kind of hard. Talk to them whenever you're at home. Talk to them when you're on the road, when you lie down. Pay attention to the Spotify playlist that is rolling in your car. Pay attention to the Netflix shows that you're watching as a family. We never get to watch TV anymore. I wish, I'm going off notes again. I wish somebody would have told me that when you had toddlers. I haven't watched TV in years. I don't even remember what it's like. And then it's like, yeah, we finally get them to bed and everyone's crying and, and, and everybody's fine. I'm crying, everyone's crying. We finally get to bed and we get in TV and I'm just about to get it turned on, uh, to turn on Netflix and the remote's way over there. It's even worth it, Lord, maybe tomorrow. And we go to sleep. I haven't watched TV in years, right? Pay attention to everything that you're doing and do life with your kids. Mirror a godly relationship with them. Talk to them when you sit at home. When you're on the road, verse eight in in Deuteronomy six, tie these symbols on your hands and your heart, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your house or your gates, or let me take this into the 21st century, get a dry erase marker and write on your kid's mirror whenever they're getting ready so that they see it, that they are beautifully and wonderfully made. Pay attention to their feeds and what they're posting. They may be asking for help, but we're not watching. Inundate their life with scripture. Something else, uh, Eden and I were talking today. If you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, this youth pastor's on fire, man. I can't wait for him to reach the next generation. Praise the Lord, my kids are up and graduated. Man, I'm telling you what, there's a lot of preachers that get really nervous about preaching on tithing. Can I just, tithing's easy. You just write a check. Preaching on evangelism is hard. When you write a check, nobody actually checks the log. We don't see what your last five checks went to. But evangelism, it's really easy to see if a tree's not producing fruit. How are we investing in our family? If you're like, man, I'm glad my kids graduated. This youth pastor's good. I can't wait for him to have fun at Falls Creek. He's gonna reach the next generation. Let me tell you, Jesus destroyed the just my family evangelism. What do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. We are called by God's word to reach our family. We are called to raise up our kids properly. We're called to set that example. But just our kid evangelism is not what God calls us to. In Luke chapter eight, everyone comes up to Jesus. They're like, yo, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Your mom's outside, your brother's outside. You gotta go help them. Your family's here. You know what Jesus said? He said, who's my family? My family is anyone that follows after the Lord. If you're sitting here saying, man, I'm glad that my kids grew up or my grandkids or whatever, I'm, I was tired, that was hard. I remember those days, right? Let me just tell you, God is still calling you to invest in the next generation. And if you are not reaching a younger Uh, man or woman in our church, if you're not raising them up, if you're not helping people like me get through raising toddlers, then you're limiting your evangelism to just your family and what you're actually doing is you're ignoring the Great Commission. Second prayer this week that you can join me in praying for our students, that these students will take ownership of their faith. That these students would get serious, right? The second thing in your notes is that our faith is in Christ. It's not in man. 
We look all throughout the book of Judges and what happens, we've got these people who didn't see the blessing and they get sucked into the world. They get sucked in to what that surrounding generation worships, what they eat, what they listen to, and they get sidetracked from God and they get into this huge amount of turmoil and strife until ultimately they cry out and they say, we don't know what else to do. And then God sends a hero, God sends a judge, and while that judge is there, there is peace. You see, what we learn through this book is that our faith has to be in Christ. It's not just in a man. It's become so popular to label our faith, right? We're, we're this or we're that. We're Baptists or we're this, right? I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminianist. I'm a this. I'm a that, right? If you really get down to it, if you're, nothing, if you're not anything else than a follower of Christ, then you're in the right place to be. I'm a disciple. That's what it looks like to take ownership in our faith. It's not Christ with this, it's just Christ. Judges chapter two, verse six and seven says this. So Joshua dismissed the Israelites. They went on to take possession of the land each to their own inheritance. And then verse seven, the people served the Lord throughout a lifetime of Joshua. And then the elders who outlived him, who had seen all the great things that the Lord did for Israel. So after that generation, so after everyone that had seen it firsthand with their eyes, what we've already talked about with verse 10 is that then the next generation that did not physically take part, that did not witness it, were completely lost and had no relationship with God. I had a seminary professor uh, when I was in school, and he, and he told us this, and it really stuck out with me. I wasn't a very great student, right? And so I don't remember a lot. But this one I remember. He said, our theology drives every decision that we make. Our theology drives every decision that we make. Now, this one's really confusing for a lot of students because we just kind of use that theology word, and we believe, oh, yeah, God teaches me theology. The reality is theology is simply what man thinks about what God has revealed, Theology, you, theology is not infallible. It does not take long to hop on YouTube or Instagram and see some terrible theology, right? Theology is not infallible. Theology is simply what man thinks about what God says. The problem happens whenever man thinks wrong. And so when we take ownership of our faith, what I am trying to come alongside families and do and what you should be doing because of the warning that we see in Judges 2.10 is we have got to teach our students, we've got to teach the next generation that God's word is authoritative. God's word is final. God's word is living, breathing, and it is true. In this world of postmodernity, where it's like there's no absolute, there's no truth, the reality is there is an absolute. There is a truth and there is a judge. Our students' theology will drive their actions. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 2, four through five. He says that my message and my preaching were not wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. It's not flashy. It's not wearing the right clothes, right? One of our biggest fears whenever we try to reach the next generation, I just don't understand why they dress the way they do. I just don't understand, I don't understand technology. I don't understand social media. I don't even have the Facebook, right? The reality is God's not calling us to have to understand it. God's calling us to invest in it. And Judges 2.10 is our warning. We do not want to be the generation that came before the lost one. Because that would be on us. Here's my third prayer for us this week. That, we would, uh, that God would be glorified in all that our students do and experience at False Creek. May God be glorified in all that our students do and experience at Falls Creek. This is a direct result of them understanding theology, taking faith, and making it their own. The third thing in your notes that I want you to see, we've gotta follow through. Judges 2, verses 18 and 19 says this, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge, 
and he saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways, even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. Following other gods, serving and worshiping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. If there's one thing I know about the next generation is that they spend a lot of time in a technological world that rips them down. What I know about my generation is that we're learning how to parent in a world where everyone online tells us a better way. So these problems, these worries are not limited to the youth that will hop on the bus with me next week. They're not limited to the young parents in my boat trying to learn like the right way to get our kids to sleep and potty train and all of that and, and, and still have a great marriage, right? It's not limited to the parents of teenagers who are just doing their best to keep up and try to figure out what apps we should delete and what apps our kids are allowed to. And it's also not limited to the older folks who still don't really know how to work the Facebook or have the email yet and they just wanna know what's going on in their kids lives, right? The reality is God is calling us to reach the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he gives us the rule book right here, and it's plain and simple. Love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. see the reality today as we go to camp there's a lot of students I don't know if you know that we did this there's there's this thing that we did it's called my one and we started this back at Easter and I told our students because of your giving we have the ability to invite one friend each and here's how it works your friend has to have never been churched they don't go to church somewhere across town and want to come to Falls Creek with us because our youth pastor is so cool right uh we're right you know uh they have to not be in church and more than likely they don't have a relationship with Jesus We called them my ones. Our students started praying for them on Easter. We did a big camp party the week after Easter and started inviting those friends. And what happens is when they sign up that kid, they get to come to camp completely free. This year, I'm telling you, we have over 25 my ones coming that have probably never heard the gospel. And for the first time ever this week, they're gonna get to hear about what Jesus did on the cross for their sins. Absolutely, absolutely. And so the band's gonna come up and in and, and today's invitation, I wanna do this a little bit different, okay? Because I know this can be scary, right? Like I've been out there, I know, every week, right? It's like, man, if we're gonna do an invitation, it's scary because people are gonna know either something's wrong in my life and I needed prayer or, or I came up because I didn't know all the right answers or whatever. That's not what an invitation is. Invitation, if you just think about this, this is an altar of our life and sometimes an actual physical response to the teaching of God's word and the worship together as a family, sometimes it elicits a physical response. And we just say, God, from what I was, I am no longer. And so today in our invitation, this isn't a scary time, this is a judgment-free zone. And what we're gonna do is we've got bracelets all across the front of the stage. And our invitation time is gonna be a little bit longer today, but I wanna ask, if you're willing and able, if you would come down, would you grab a bracelet? On the bracelet, there's a name, it's either a leader or a student that's coming with us. Some of those are those my ones. Some of those are the students that brought their my ones and they've been praying since Easter. Some of those are the leaders who are going a whole week without Diet Coke and they don't know what to do. Some of those are me. I leave today. I'm still not even sure what's going on. We're just hoping to get 200 there and 200 back, right? (laughs) All that say, we need prayer. And shame on us if our kids or grandkids were to be a Judges 2 generation, shame on us. Today, God is calling us to act. Act in prayer, yes. Put this bracelet on, pray with us all week, absolutely. God's also calling you, find somebody in our church. Not just your small group. Don't use the small group Sunday school excuse that that's your discipleship for the week. You should find somebody and invest in them. 
Some of y'all that have survived the toddler days, you need to find me. Invest in us. Y'all think I'm joking. I'm serious. Pray that God would give you that gospel relationship. Pray that you would be a, that God would show you who you are to disciple. And, in, and the reality is, in a room this size, some of us came in today, and the book of Judges is real live. We've been sucked into the world. We're comparing our parenting. We're comparing, we're comparing our kids. Our kids don't even want to go to church. I don't know what I did wrong. My marriage is in shambles. I don't know how to save it. And you read this book and it sounds really good. Man, God had it figured out. Everything kind of got messed up and then God sent a judge and there was peace. There was peace for 80 years. There was peace for 40 years. There was peace for 45 years. There were 12 judges that came to the people of Israel and each time there was peace. And when the judge died, everything went to shambles. Some of us, our life is in shambles right now. And here's the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is that the final judge has come. The final hero of the story has come and he died on a cross for our sins. His name is Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did in our place was he took the penalty that we deserved because the wage of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Some of y'all need to come up here and yeah, grab a bracelet. But some of us today, I believe, God is calling us to surrender our life to him. We've been waiting on that big break, that big promotion, that raise for our kids to get right for them to get a D1 scholarship so we don't have to pay for college. Whatever we're waiting on that, that is our judge, maybe God is simply calling us to trust in him as judge and accept the hero that he sent in our place, whose name is Jesus. Would you stand? I'm gonna pray for us for a second and then this altar is full of bracelets. Would you come pray over our students? Would you pray that God would put somebody in your life that you can invest in? If you've been waiting on your big break, can I tell you, you don't wanna to leave today wondering because salvation is here, it's now. First Peter 2.10 tells us that once we were not a people, but now we're the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we receive mercy. Today could be your First Peter 2.10 moment. Let's pray and then let's worship. God, thank you for the book of Judges. Thank you for sending heroes in our place. God, that you would send your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sin, for my mistakes, sins that people don't even know about, sin that I didn't even know I would do. Before I was even born, you sent your son to die for him. That doesn't even make sense, God. But for that love today, we say thank you. God, I pray that you would reach the lives of students next week. I pray that students that are lost would come to know you. I pray that leaders that are tired would find energy in you. And I pray for students that have been sidetracked by the world, that they would be redeemed and brought back to your name. It's in your love and your precious son that we pray. Amen.